and you're back here on Likeable Science on another Friday afternoon. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Thanks for joining us. And Likeable Science is all about how science is a vital, interesting, and dynamic part of everyone's life. Uh, it, we face the same kinds of challenges uh, uh, in science as we do in other parts of our lives, and we all uh, overcome them, too. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, with me, joining me via Skype, is Tanea Valerie, who is a doctoral candidate in molecular physics and biochemistry at Yale University. Welcome, Tanea. Hello, Ethan. How are you? I'm doing well. Very nice of you to join me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I had run into Tanea through a, a column that she wrote. Uh, in, it was published in Science Magazine. There's a, a weekly column called The Working Life. And Tanea wrote about uh, a column called Growth from Failure and talked about the struggles she'd run into with experiments not working and uh, all kinds of difficulties and the frustrations and actually shame she felt about this until she sort of had a breakthrough and overcame that, began reaching out and getting, getting some help from her mentors and some of her lab peers and, and has grown from this and, and become a, a better person and a better scientist. Is that fair to say? <laughs> yes, definitely. That's where the growth comes from, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I, I was so impressed by this because it, it harked back to an experience I had had as a, as a, uh, a graduate student when I realized somewhere in my about third or fourth year of graduate school that I gathered this mountain of data, but I had been refining my techniques all along and finally was just going to have to throw all this data out and sort of start all over with a, a, a basically now my, my finally refined experimental technique. And it was very, very discouraging, but uh, yes, we, we break on through these things. So wh why, don't, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about, about this, Tanea? Yeah, so um, this piece was featured in Science, so that's one of the top journals in our community. And how it came about was that uh, I reviewed, I wrote in about another working life piece, and then I was corresponding with the editor, and she asked if I had something to contribute. And, I said, sure. And so when we were talking, she's like, well, we really want to hear about turning points, you know, graduate student experiences that really change how you look at science or how you function at the lab bench. And, and this was one of those crucial times. At the time, this piece was about one of the top most painful experiences that I had. And um, the reason I chose to write about it was because I hoped it resonate with others. In fact, it took a lot, a lot of courage for me, and, and I had to push myself to be really revealing about what happened because it was such a a, a point of you know of pain because that it was a you know failure. I had failed, and but it, there was also growth. And then I hoped to share that you know growth with everyone else, and I would resonate with them. Yeah, absolutely, and it, it's a, it's an interesting. An interesting point that people, as you, as you commented, type A people don't like to admit that they are failing, they're having problems, they are sort of reluctant sometimes to reach out to ask for help. Um, and of course, that you realize, of course, you're in your lab, you're surrounded by other people whose experiments all appear to be successful, but then you realize they might just be hiding their problems, their failures from you, right? Just as you were sort of trying to hide yours from them. Uh, yeah. It's it's almost it's so much energy to keep up the this illusion of perfection, <laughs> <laughs> but and what actually gave me uh, courage to you know start asking for help or you know that sort of thing was actually paying attention more closely and seeing that my colleagues were, in fact, reaching out for help. So sometimes when we view the the perfection in ourselves, we expect we see it in others, but when you start paying attention to what actually is happening around you, you might see that there is, you know, uh, people asking for help and you just didn't pay attention. Yeah. Right. You find that the, the apparently super talented superstar actually does have difficulty and they, they can't pipe pet worth a damn or something like this, you know. Yeah. Uh, they're a terrible speller, whatever it may be, you know, you can find if you, if you examine it. Yeah, they are facing some challenges too. So, um, um, so do you find this has really now made a difference in your life? I mean, are you now reaching out and trying to be more helpful to others? Uh, well, I've, I've always been very keen on helping others. But for me, what the turning point was that when I see myself like creeping into that like fear of failure and when I like start closing up and not sharing what's really happening, 
I actually have this moment of, you know, like, okay, this is what's happening <laughs> and we can't let this happen again. And it would, was positive like reinforcement of that is that since I've started reaching out more and definitely being much more open about my failures during um, my weekly meetings with my, my lab, I'm very, you know, honest about, okay, I'm really scared about, you know, this coming out correctly, or I say that I lost sleep over, you know, waiting for these results. But when I'm, I'm much more open, I've just gotten positive feedback back. You know, like, you, it was just reinforced that if you're open, people are going to be open back at you. And, and it's been a, a great experience because of that. And I'm glad I've chose this way of talking about my science. Yeah, ab absolutely. I recall uh, years ago being in a, in a uh, position in an in a, uh, organization and my boss, the chief operating officer, just sort of casually mentioned back when he got fired from this job. And, and I, was, I was sort of taken aback. It's like, wow, like this guy is saying, like, I got fired from, the, from this job, and I think I was very sensitive because I had shortly before been fired from the job, and, and hearing him say it sort of told me, oh, this is okay, this happens to other people too. I'm not the only person who's been fired, right? And, and people live through it, they survive, they thrive, they go on bigger and better things, you know, and uh, so it was, uh, that, that is, that, it's a, that openness is very, as you say, it's sort of relaxing almost to, to do it. I, I agree because what's been a really cool, unforeseeable aspect of writing this piece is that people are reaching out to me. Uh, I had this fantastic email from a student, a gra another graduate student who was going through a challenging time, and he wrote to me saying that how he got courage or he you know, was able to be more courageous in what was going on around him and his own pro his own difficulty in grad school because he read my piece. and. And, and that's the sort of thing that you hope happens when you're open oh, about yeah. these failures. And it, it seems like that is a case for your, in your situation too. No, that, that, that's gotta be gratifying knowing that, yeah, that your, uh, your open like that has, has really, has done someone else some good and, and helped them survive a difficult time and, and, and make it through. You know? So, um, and has this translated into other aspects of your life other than your research? Yeah, um, certainly. Uh, you, you, know, uh, you know, besides the bench, there's, you know, other things that we do. And, and one of them happens to be, you know, preparing for our career after we earn our PhD. And so I'm talking about a kind of a student organization and postdoc organization at Yale where we work on networking and um, reaching out to people and you know uh working on softer skills business skills and so when i talk about some of the struggles that i had at first uh while i was learning some of these skills of networking um that has been really helpful for some of the younger people that are, jo are joining um and so yeah i would definitely say that this sort of uh you know resilience and being open is applicable to any sort of aspect of your life and um as we were talking about before uh, off, off the screen, we were talking about, uh, you know, I have, I have read books to help me get through these times. And, and some of these books uh, come from authors that are, you know, former Navy SEALs uh, or, you know, someone that's also in a research uh, position. But it, you can get inspiration to overcome any sort of life struggle from other people that might not be scientists in the case for me. Um, everyone, you know, experiences these struggles yeah yes uh, everyone has to face challenges in life and, and learn to deal with them and, and not let them dominate their life and, and sort of ruin a life but but just be a part of your life that you you cope with maybe it's not what you want you know but uh you, you can get through it um and it really i think this speaks to this sort of broader issue of uh and people call it different things people talk about collaboration People talk about strategic alliances, people talk about friendship, people talk about outsourcing. Uh, and, and these things all, to some extent, can be the same sort of uh, activities in the sense of reaching out and getting, uh, getting some help on some aspect that you may, may need where you, where you find somebody who can do something better than you can do it, or more easily or more effectively. And hopefully, of course, there's some reciprocity in, in, in the whole business, right? Yeah, collaboration is so key. And that's the other thing that I've been really embracing 
is that as a community or in my case as a lab you work together to make things happen and it is so important um and not only do you have to be willing to accept help that's number one but also just be grateful for it and and then of course paying forward if you can't pay back you know you pay forward to help others and the when you do that you just bring in so many different talents you know so for example we have a lab manager who works with you know sales reps to get our reagents at affordable price and if that person wasn't there and didn't have that sort of network i would struggle more at the bench um, and so these sort of thing you know having these key roles within the lab or any community is so important for keeping it all running smoothly in the end and then making it such a thriving environment for everyone to do well that you know um, it's, it's actually really interesting. I'm, I'm reading this book by Adam Grant, and he's a professor at the Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania. And in it was an interesting study with um, cardiac surgeons and also um, some financial uh, uh, analysts, too. And then what they found were that they, there were these stars, right, the super outperforming uh, you know, stars of the cardiac surgeons that uh, did really well. And what they found was that if they were in a thriving environment that they actually had a lower incidence of death um, in their surgery that had nothing to do with practice. Like the common thought is that you practice, you'll do better. But also what he, he was reporting in the book was that the cardiac surgeons actually thrived and also depending on the hospital community there. Um, so it, it's important for all aspects, I would say. Um, absolutely. I, I've actually just been reading a little bit about Google's uh, Project Aristotle they spent years actually analyzing what, what made it for a good team. Um, but I want, I want to switch gears for just a moment here, because uh, we, we talked about persistence and, and as part of resiliency and all, and I want to tell one of my little campfire stories here, a little peculiar science uh, piece that uh, perhaps will be of interest to some people. This one is something I only recently ran into. There are uh, a little caterpillar that eventually becomes a moth, uh, called the woolly bear caterpillar, uh, I think that's a name that's applied to a lot of different caterpillars, actually. But, but the ones that live in the Arctic face a peculiar challenge. These little caterpillars have a very, very short time, only a few months of the year, when they can be active. And <clears throat> as a caterpillar, you have one job, and that's to eat a lot of food as fast as you can to get the, the energy to turn into a uh, butterfly or a moth. And <clears throat> there simply is not enough time from the time these things hatch until the... the upcoming fall for them to get enough food. So come fall, the little woolly bear caterpillar crawls under a rock, basically. And then as winter sets in, they freeze. And they freeze absolutely solid. The rock is buried under snow. The, the, literally, the woolly, woolly bear's caterpillar's body is completely solidly frozen. And come spring, everything begins to thaw out. And eventually, the woolly bear caterpillar thaws out and resumes eating and proceeds to keep eating and eating, eating as fast as it can. And it doesn't just do this once or twice. These things go through 14 years, 14 cycles of freezing and thawing for 14 years before finally one summer they have finally eaten enough that they are now ready, they pupate, and then they pop out as a moth lip for a few more weeks and die. But I thought it was one of the most amazing things I, I, I'd heard in a long time. That, and again, it just, it, I think it ties in with this whole business of persistence, right? These things put up with being frozen solid 14 different times in order to sort of make it through through their life, you know, and get to where they need to be. <clears throat> Anyhow, on that on that persistent note, uh, we're going to take a short break here, about a, a minute break, and uh, I'm talking with Tania Valerie, a uh, doctoral student at Yale, and we're talking about uh, uh, setbacks turning into success. We'll be right back. I pity the fool who ain't watching this show at 12 o'clock on Friday afternoon. Stan, the energy man, watch it. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm here with Pete McGinnis Mark to talk about HIGP and research in Manoa. What about that show, Pete? I think it's great, Jay. Research at Manoa really provides faculty members at the University of Hawaii with an easy way of explaining some of the research activities we're conducting on the campus. For example, I do a lot of space research, whether it's the Moon and Mars, but many of my other colleagues do other interesting kinds of work, whether it's exploring the ocean floor in submarines, studying earthquakes and tsunamis or other activities. So research at Manoa really provides us with a way of telling the general public 
some of the activities which we're involved in, as well as communicating to our colleagues and students. That this is a fun science, and we really appreciate the activities which research at Manoa enable us to talk about. I love research at Manoa. Come around, join us. It's Monday, 1 o'clock p.m., every single Monday. Be there or be square. <laughs> And we're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Joining me today via Skype is Tanea Valerie. She's a doctoral student in uh, molecular, uh, molecular physics and biochemistry at Yale University. And uh, Tanea wrote this wonderful column uh, in uh, the Working Life uh, Weekly Column in Science, got published, uh, called Growth from Failure, in which she very openly and honestly discussed her setbacks, her struggles, her, her failures, and what this meant to her emotionally, and how she sort of worked through it, and, and has uh, grown from, from this, and learned more to reach out, to, to seek help when she needs it, to, to look to other people for uh, advice and assistance. And, you know, it, it, it's great, but there is a whole issue, of course, you can't just do this randomly, right? You have to uh, have the right people around you. And, of course, you're working in a, in a research lab where the head of your lab presumably has rather carefully selected folks, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully a good balance of people with complementary skills and personalities that, that don't break too badly, at least. <coughs> because, yes, as, as you point out, you, you have to have a good, uh, a, a good collaborative team there because you're all working on closely related projects, and so the work you're doing supports some of your lab mates and their work supports yours and the PI is trying, I assume, to tell a, a particular story. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, I would say my, my PA does an exceptional job in, in putting that in and that's something I hope to learn from her, you know, a skill of hiring someone from one interview or, or two and, and get to know who that person is and seeing how they would fit in your team and how they would thrive. And what I've seen and, and this is with working with students you know uh, um, as a graduate student we also teach and we teach undergraduates um, so for me that would be Yale undergraduates and and it's it's interesting because you know when you you approach these sort of situations um, where it can be difficult and challenging you often see the strongest characteristics of the people around you and um, what's really important is that everyone gives and, and gives back um, and is supportive of each other and and tries not to judge each other. And so I think those are really important characteristics to have in um, the team that you're working with, but also the team that may be under you or um, even above you, the, the leadership team. And uh, I, it's it's so it's an important learning experience. It's not something I appreciated when I was younger. <laughs> something that you kind of have to live. <laughs> it, that's, that's intriguing to hear you say that because this is exactly what this uh, project Aristotle found was that people have to, to make a good team, people have to feel psychologically safe. They have mm -hmm. to have an environment where they know they can express their ideas freely and they're not going to be sort of judged or laughed at or made fun of. They've got to um, be able to share and communicate. Uh, it doesn't work if one team member talks all the time and another never talks. They, 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 actually, the amount of talking, it turns out, among team members has to be pretty much equal, equal out over, over the long term for teams to be successful. And then the other thing they brought out is that the most effective teams have people who score very high on empathy ratings, people who are very good at, at reading other human beings, reading facial expressions, reading body language. Uh, those are people who typically uh, when you get a bunch of them on a team, your team works quite well because they then, of course, are tuned into how the other team members are feeling and can can react more appropriately. Whereas people who are not empathetic, you know, will run roughshod over you at a time when you're trying to reach out for help, and they won't they won't see it or hear it, and may may not respond appropriately, and that will, of course, discourage you then from. You know. Yeah, I, I completely agree, and, and there's even this fact where you kind of have to let you know, you have to forgive your other teammates because sometimes we get really excited about the science, right? And so someone might be really energetic. And this is where, um, you know, criticism might seem harsh or, you know, negative, really negative. But uh, what's important when you're receiving that too is that to remember that 
and if luckily if you're in that environment this is really important you have to have that trust already but that you know that that person's coming from a good place and as you mentioned having empathy uh is a great characteristic because i i uh experienced this where another team member will come in and kind of smooth it out you know like if one team member is really energetic about giving their criticism and maybe not be conscientious of how harsh they're coming across even though they have really good intentions Sometimes it's really great to have that third person coming in saying, oh, okay, you know, like what she's doing is really great. Um, and, you know, uh, this is the focus that she needs to go in and, you know, like kind of help bring, because we're all human, we all make mistakes. And, and I think working as a team, it, it's so crucial in so many ways. Yeah. Ab absolutely. And that, that uh, willingness to understand that, yes, the other person uh, well, it sounds like they're criticizing you harshly. May not may not mean it that way. They may be trying to be very helpful to you, and just sort of stylistically, they're they're sort of blowing it. Uh, and, and yes, if you're lucky, there's a, a third team member around to sort of mediate the whole thing and tell the tell the criticizer to tone it down a bit and, and highlight some of your good stuff too, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but if there isn't, you just have to be able to do some of that yourself and realize, nah, this person, yeah, they don't they don't really mean to be this way. They're just they're just it's just coming across that way. So that's, again, why it is important to have good people around and to sort of choose your, uh, choose your team members, uh, you know, well and carefully, right? Because, yeah, um, my, my, my wife likes to say, you know, she says, I love working with smart, good-hearted people. And she says, I, I can work with dumb but good-hearted people because they're good-hearted and you can, you can get past things. And I can work with smart, bad-hearted people because if they're smart, again, you can... You can help them see why they need to do it this way. But she says there's no future in working with dumb, bad-hearted people, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just give up on them right away, you know? <laughs> yeah. They're not going to be good teammates. <laughs> yeah, and that's something that I've also come to appreciate. A good leader also needs to recognize when a team isn't working, right? Because uh, we talked about how collaboration is so important, but sometimes you might not really get the good set or like the right sense of someone and then knowing when to you know call it quits too and knowing when like some that interaction isn't working can also be a valuable skill yeah and, and it's, it's it's funny because scientists and scientists training does not typically train them in, in those sorts of arts to be able to spot subtle human interactions to be able to to be good empathizers um, and so it was interesting what you were saying earlier uh, that you, you think your lab head is amazingly good at, at pulling people out after even a brief interaction and realizing if this person will work or won't work in your group. And that, that is a, undoubtedly a valuable skill. But, and it apparently is a skill, too, that can be taught a bit, I gather. But um, <laughs> Yeah, I, this is actually something that I think we need to work on in graduate student education. Mm -hmm. We need to have a course in this and how to manage a lab, right? Uh, personnel, human management, um, human resources, I think is the official term. And it is something we need to work on and incorporate into our education because uh, as we've been talking about through this, uh, our conversation is that an effective scientific team, and this is true for any sort of discipline, but definitely true for science, that if they're to thrive and do really well and ask really interesting questions that push the forefront of science forward and our knowledge base forward, that you just, you have to have that, you know, and um, not take it for granted. Yeah. Right, but but it's it's true. I mean, more and more, uh, and all the the studies that are being done in the business world now suggest more and more of our work is done in teams, and less less and less are we working on our own. And therefore, this idea of teamwork is more and more critical. And yet again, in our traditional schooling, we don't typically do much of this at all. We you take you you work alone by yourself. You take tests by yourself. You're not allowed to ask for help on some, some kinds of assignments. And so we don't get a lot of practice in it. And you're, you're right. I mean, sometimes working in a science lab may be the first real experience of, of real sort of close collaboration that, that some people have. Uh, and yes, uh, I agree. I think that you should suggest that to the Yale administration. They should be <laughs> Yeah, I'll have to, to mention it to them. Right. <laughs> yeah. The, there, there's so many other things, too, that we would need to learn. but. Yeah, maybe even like a, a course in empathy, as you mentioned, right. would be great for us. <laughs> yeah, that would be a key aspect of, of the, the good teamwork, uh, above and beyond the communication skills. And I used to do a little bit of that, was, was working on graduate students with their communication skills, because I had learned that it was 
it's all too easy to drift back into, into scientific jargon. And so I used to, when I would be at a, a party early in my graduate years, and people would say, well, what do you do? And I'd say, well, I'm using an operant conditioning paradigm to study the photopic and scotopic spectral sensitivity of the African cichlid haplochromus bertoni. And people were usually asleep or they'd wandered off by the time I got through that. And yeah. I learned after a while to say, instead, I train fish. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and that was much more effective uh, uh, way to communicate. And because immediately the questions would start flowing. People, you know, what, why do you train fish? How do you train fish? What are you training them to do? And the, and the conversation flowed and communication flourished. But, so I, I learned that, that trying to simplify things down uh, can, can be a very powerful thing. And I used to work with the, the doctoral students in nanotechnology at UW to, to train them to tell about their work in, in more accessible terminology. You know? Yeah, and, and I think something, because um, you know, I can only speak from the scientist side, and I know we're, we're talking to an audience that might be in a little more mixed, is that we scientists actually really care that everyone knows what we're doing, uh, because we love it so much, it's our passion, right? And and when they don't get it, they have that like starry-eyed look like, oh, yeah, okay, wow, that's really cool. But that's not what we like. We actually like interacting with people and, and talking about our research, because um, not only is it our passion and, and what you know, drives us, but we want other people to be enthusiastic too, you know? And for my case, you're studying fish, so I study, you know, RNA molecules. And I think it's really cool how they, their structures work and, and how that goes toward how they um, function in a cell, you know, how they, they make things happen. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I, it's so important. It's, I'm so glad to hear that you're, you're teaching these, these graduate students how to do it properly. And I just want everyone to know that we, we actually do want, uh, we scientists, the scientific community, really care about sharing our interests. Right. I mean, this is, gets back to Einstein's famous dictum that you really don't understand something well until you can explain it to your grandmother. You know? and, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it, it is true. Well, hey, th this has been a, a wonderful conversation, and I very much appreciate your being here, your being on the show. And, uh, sharing your very likable science and your, your very likable approach to science uh, with me here and with, with our viewers. And um, it's uh, certainly, I feel like I've learned a ton from you and uh, that's, that's, that's always great. I always feel like that, that makes for a good show. I hope, I hope it's been a, a good experience for you. And I hope, I hope perhaps uh, I'll get you back at some point and, and uh, we can talk further. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's been a true pleasure to talk with you, and uh, I look forward and to, to interacting with you more. And I've certainly learned a lot, too, about what you said about the group Aristotle. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, really interesting. So, uh, Tanea Valerie, a doctoral student at Yale University, has been with us today, and I hope you will come back and join us next week on Likeable Science.